In today's world, we may have to use other auditors and experts to help us in the um, conclusion of the audit that we're doing. Now, this can be dependent on the availability of uh, the auditors that I have or the need of uh, subject matter experts that I might not have on my staff to be able to assist in the auditing. I may even have to outsource to other auditors or experts, but it's important to remember that the goal is to make sure I have the appropriate resources available for the audit and that the people doing the audits are knowledgeable in the areas in which they've been assigned. And that may mean that you have to go out to uh, get the services of other auditors. Now, prior to engaging these outside resources, you need to make sure that you cover things like the restrictions of outsourcing based on the current laws and regulations that you have to follow. Whatever contractual stipulations you might have to allow you to bring these outsiders in. Do they cause an impact to the audit objectives? Would the inclusion of outsiders add additional audit risk or more liability? Remembering that ultimately the liability relies on you when you were uh, chartered for the original audit. You need to make sure you know, look at the independence and objectivity of the outside resource. Now, that's an important thing because let's say there's a specific technology. Uh, I'm not going to pick any vendor for you, but it's very complex and maybe it's so complex that it's hardly used or there's a limited number of people who are capable of uh, really understanding this, uh, this uh, bit of equipment or control. If I hire somebody from the vendor who made the control to do the audit, they might not be so objective if they know that their uh, product has some flaws that they don't want to tell us about, right? So you make sure you, you have the independence and objectivity of whoever that outside resource is and that they have the competence, the qualifications and experience to be able to perform the audit and also make sure you have good methods of communication. The auditor needs to remember that the use of an outside resource is not going to reduce their liability. I can't say, oh, they did it. They're the ones that made the, made the mistake. You hired them. You brought them in. So you are liable for their conclusions. That means you need to communicate the objectives, the scope and the methodology. Make sure there is a monitoring process of regular reviews with the outside work that's being done. And also look at the usefulness of the results that are being provided to you by the external resource. Another part of auditing is the use of Computer Assisted Audit Techniques, uh, C-A-A-T, and I'm just going to call it CAT, or CATS for plural. And CATS are important tools that, as an auditor, you need to use to gather information in this IS environment. By today's standards, you're almost always going to need some sort of software tool to gather and analyze information. And the CATS do that. They can help you gather information independently. Now, there, when I say CATS, that's not a software, but a collection of uh, software that would fall under edit te uh, audit techniques. And that means that they represent a variety of tools and techniques. One example is what we call GAS, the generalized audit software. Now when we talk about GAS, it refers to some standard software that can directly read and access data from a variety of different database platforms. It has the functions to be able to get to file access, file reorganization, data selection. It can uh, provide statistical functions different types of uh, mathematical functions for us. But again, it's a tool that was designed specifically for the auditing of databases. As an auditor, you should review the evidences gathered during the audit to determine that the operations reviewed were well controlled and effective. That also means that as an auditor, you should have sufficient judgment and experience to be able to make those types of determinations. Now, one of the things you might use in making those determinations is what's con uh, called a control matrix and it can help uh, assess the proper level of controls. So if you think of a chart with two axes, what you can say is that the uh, known types of errors are replaced at the top axis, and the known controls for detection uh, or correction are placed on the um, side axis, and, uh, and then you can just kind of chart the control matrix to be able to say, you know, these types of errors go with these types of controls, and, uh, and to be able to uh, start mapping that out as well. As we continue to talk about audit strengths and weaknesses, you need to remember that in some instances, one strong control might be able to compensate for a weak control in another area. You also may look at having overlapping controls as uh, being considered as two strong controls. Normally, the control objective is not achieved by considering one control adequate. Instead, you should be looking at um, and should perform tests to evaluate how one control might relate 
to other controls. So generally, a group of controls, when you aggregate them together, can act as a compensating control and minimize risk. Now let me put all that into perspective for you with the example of a firewall and an intrusion detection system. So you might decide that uh, you look at a firewall and you say, okay, it's a, here's what the control does. It's doing its job well. It looks at uh, uh, IP addresses and uh, transport layer protocols and makes a decision about permitting or denying that traffic to come through. And so it seems to be a very good control in that area. Um, but uh, it's kind of weak in that people can still send buffer overflows through the firewall because all the firewall is looking at is the IP addresses and the transport protocol and not looking into the data. So we might have another compensating control like an intrusion detection system that can then look at the information that comes out of the firewall and evaluate the same uh, information only for a different type of, um, of uh, you know, attack, buffer overflows, malware, that sort of stuff. And together, they are working together uh, to be able to give you a better sense of, uh, of uh, security. And that's you know, where you consider them overlapping because they're looking at the same packets that are going through the network. Um, and again, you know, one control objective um, might not be been adequate by itself, but together, when aggregated together, they can act as a very good compensating control to really minimize risk. We also need to judge the materiality of findings. Now, materiality is a key issue uh, when the auditor is deciding what findings to bring forward. It will also depend on what is significant to the different levels of management as well. Uh, as far as what they want to, what they're I basically, I guess you could say, is what they're in charge of. Now, you have to use your judgment to decide which findings you're going to present to the different levels of management. But at some point, it's important that all of the findings are included in your reports so that it's available, especially at the very top end of the management uh, at the CEO level or uh, CIO level, so that uh, they have full knowledge of, uh, of the findings. But when it comes to the different areas of management, they may have different areas of concern, and so what's material to them is different than another group. So that's kind of the idea again is, uh, uh, you know, how do you judge that materiality of findings? And it really almost is a matter of perspective as well.